Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Alistair, and I work at a company in Toronto called Nuology. And it's a great place to work. I've been working there for about five years on a code base that's about 12 years old. It's a really large code base. I think it's about, with tests, it's something like 500,000 lines of uh, Ruby on Rails code, 300 models. Like it's, it's a very large code base. And when you work in such a large code base, uh, names are very important. And I think um, when you're programming in the small, you can get away with perhaps poor names. But as your program gets larger and larger, obviously you have more and more names, and you need some kind of system for generating the names. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So it's kind of unbelievable to me, but I actually wrote my first program in 1974. And it was in high school. And my, my math teacher decided that we should start having a, I think he called it the computer science club or something. And we started writing programs. And because he was a math teacher, we mostly did mathematical problems. And I was in grade 11. And the program that I was probably most happy with was actually solved this. Uh, it was called the simplex method of solving uh, a system of linear equations represented as a matrix. And so we'd, we'd sketch out our solutions on the blackboard. And then we'd transfer our program to graph paper. And we'd check it fairly carefully. And then we transfer it to these uh, cards. We didn't have a key punch, so we'd use, uh, we'd use a pencil. And we'd, we'd fill out our cards, carefully transferring them from the graph paper, put, them in an you know, put an elastic band around them, and we'd put them in a box. And the box would go downstairs to the office. And at some point, there'd be some kind of inter-school inter e mail system, and they would be taken to the administrative building where there was a large mainframe in the basement. At some point after that, someone would take my cards out of the box and they'd run them through the, they'd run them as a batch job. There'd be some kind of printout because otherwise you couldn't tell what your program did. The paper would get wrapped around your um, cards. The last week would be wrapped around that, be put in the box, it would be sent back to the school board and we'd get it. So the compile cycle was about three days. <laughs> so, so it's kind of unbelievable how much things have changed since then. And I would, you know, I, in those days, you'd be very careful about, you know, a small typo or anything like that, right? You'd read your code over many times before you would actually um, submit it. Obviously, you couldn't make very much code. Uh, you know, these days, I can make much more code. So for myself, I, I, le I eventually learned uh, professional programming in C. And then I switched to C++, and that was a really nice advance. And then I switched to Java. And these days, I do, um, I use... Uh, Ruby and, and Rails and Postgres are the main tools that I use every day. I've been using those for about five years. Now, I wanted to mention uh, Postgres because what's really interesting is that I learned SQL you know, 30 years ago. It, you know, it was developed uh, in academia in the 60s, and it was first commercialized in the 70s. I mean, Larry Ellison owes his fortune to really bringing the first relational database into, uh, into the commercial world. So SQL has been something that has been valuable to learn, and it's lasted kind of 30 years. Whereas my, you know, my knowledge of Fortran, I, I don't use anything from that uh, these days. I don't really use C, C++, Java. I don't use any of those. So what I, what I found over my career is that the, the half-life of my knowledge is something like five years, meaning every five years, about half of what you know is no longer valuable, and you're going to have to replace it with something else. However, along the way, there are those things which I found a picture of some gold nuggets, I think little nuggets of things that actually have long lasting life. And if you can find those, you, can, you don't have to kind of rebuild your knowledge quite so often. So that's really what I wanted to talk about today, a particular nugget that I think is like super valuable. And it's this idea that naming is really very, very deeply connected with um, designing. And also that the opposite is true. Designing is very deeply connected with naming. And really, the two go hand in hand. And so what I wanted to do today is take you through a particular example that happened on a project that I worked on about a year ago. And I want to take you through all the different steps that I took to improving the design and improving the names. Then after we get through the example, we'll sort of circle back and talk about some of the theory and some of the practice that you could use on your own program to do something similar. 
So the program is called QCloud, and it's used by people uh, on, a, on an iPad typically, and they'd be wandering around a factory doing quality control. That's where the Q comes from, quality control. QC, QCloud. It's quite a simple application because what happens is people design a form and then people fill out the form and we call that a sheet and a sheet might have several inspections. And today we're going to talk about sheets. If you, you know, if you're on the highway somewhere and you, you stop off at a, a restaurant and you go into the washroom, you might see like a piece of paper on the back of the door in the washroom. And it'll have signatures and people's name on it, right? That'll be, that's like a, that's like a sheet with inspections happening. Here's, a, here's an inspection from, uh, this is like a real example from one of the, uh, our customer's inspections. So there's one inspection. It's the color of the, of the tamper strip. So the person would be taking a sample of some product that would have been created and they look at the little tamper strip and say, yeah, it is red. So I, that inspection passes. Um, there's an, there was one company who's processing cheese and they're, they're making sliced cheese, I guess, out of big giant blocks of cheese. And the first inspection they have is called, does it smell? <laughs> so that's, apparently they're actually, that's one of the ways in which they inspect their product to make sure it's fine. The other thing is that you're gonna have to capture a name. So we wanna know who actually submitted the inspection, who actually did that inspection. So that's the problem we're gonna try and solve. This is the database table for a sheet and it's representing the sheet on the right. One thing that's very interesting is when you look at this table, you go, hmm, there's like a little pattern going on in here. There's four columns, then there's another four columns that have some kind of repetition. So often one of the first places you want to start when you're naming things or looking for design and improving your abstractions is to notice this kind of pattern of duplication. So here we see some duplication. So there's something going on and we want to try and solve this duplication. So this is the starting point of our example. And we're just going to kind of work through it. And this is really what happened on this project as well. So when I joined the team, I noticed, hmm, this just seems weird. We're, we're, we're missing some kind of concept. When you get this kind of repetitive naming, you can see the reviewed, 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 submitted, submitted, submitted. So there's, whoever made those column names is basically telling us that they're somehow related. But it's not very strongly represented in the application at the moment. Now, what I would say is, I would say that the sheet is composed of a reviewed and a submitted something or other. It doesn't have a name at this point, right? So we would like to give it a name. So what, what should we call it? How should we, how should we approach this problem? Well, it turns out that in Rails, there's a composed of class macro that we can use to actually express the concept of one object being contained with another object. When an object's contained inside, it's either zero or one. Like it's not, you could put them, you could put it in a separate table, but it, oftentimes it makes more sense to just have it inside the table. The canonical example that they always use, and they use it on, in the Rails guides too, is an address. Typically an address is composed of multiple fields, but you think of like one address being as part of a bill. Or perhaps for your cable bill, there's a billing address plus a shipping address, something like that. And both of those addresses are of the same type. And you never have, you either have no address or one address. So you don't actually need to put it in a separate table. So composed of, it's for representing uh, a little small object that's sort of hiding out inside another table. <coughs> so this is my, uh, my active model object that represents the sheet. And this is what I would have to say if I wanted to tell uh, active model that these four uh, fields are actually the fields of a single object. And I would use this composed of uh, macro. And I have to do it twice, right? Because we've got two of these little objects hiding inside the sheet object. So you can see the connection between the columns in the database and the value object that I've created here. You can see the class name says attribution event. So it turned out that that's what we decided to name this little collection of four parameters. We decided to name it an attribution event. When the whole project kicked off, it was originally called Enable, well, the product people came up with this name with the rest of the team and we called it Enable Attributability Workflows. 
And as soon as we had the word attributability, we realized it's not a very good word, right? It's not a great name. <laughs> nobody could say it, nobody could spell it, but it was going, you know, it was seeping into our code everywhere. So we decided, no, no, let's just call it an attribution event because we're attributing the review or we're attributing the submission to a particular person. And so this is how we can say it. So we've actually, we've actually, we've actually got some abstraction now. Instead of just four columns by themselves, we've now got, we've grouped them together into a little value object called an attribution event. So this is sort of the typical flow of how you improve your code. You notice some duplication and you decide to abstract it. And as soon as you abstract it, you, you realize you need, now need a name. So we coined the name attribution event. Now attribution event is just a little value object. This is what it looks like. We just have to specify how the four columns are gonna map into attributes on this little value object. And we do that through the constructor. So previously, this, I, I would argue that this little object was kind of hanging out, hiding before, right? This type was hiding inside um, the table. The fact that we always had those same four columns duplicated meant that whoever wrote this code kind of understood that there was a type hiding out. So we've actually made an accomplishment here. We've taken these four things and we've actually given these four columns that are associated and we've now come up with a name for them. So now, now on the team, we can talk about a sheet being composed of a reviewed and a submitted attribution event. Now, what is an attribution event? Well, once you look at it, you could sort of say, well, it identifies a user and there's a timestamp. Nice. So there's the user identification. We could just keep the user ID, but we decided to make a copy of the email and a copy of the name in case that changed, right? Sometimes when you're sort of capturing things to uh, make a recording, you have to actually copy the attributes as opposed to just having a reference. So we copy over the email and we copy over the, the name. And we keep it over the user ID in case it changes, right? And this is the timestamp. Now, I think, you know, on the team we realized we had this increased understanding. We've got, now got an attribution event, which is a user and a timestamp. But if you look at the way this code is written, you can't really, the, the user concept's not really quite as uh, pulled out as it could be. So we're gonna improve that in a moment. Here's what we had before. If you wanted to create one of these attribution events before, you would assign all four uh, attributes one at a time. We made a small improvement where now we can do this. We can assign the attributes all at once after creating one of these little tiny attribution events. And depending on whether we uh, assign it to the submitted attribution event or the reviewed attribution event, the same type goes into different columns. However, as soon as you do this and you look at it, you go, hmm, we've got inspector, inspector, inspector. We got, a little, we got some more duplication happening here. So once again, we need to do something to make the code a little bit more abstract. So you just wanna be really sensitive to seeing these kinds of bits of duplication. How do we solve the duplication problem? Well, because we've got a little object, we can actually put a nice little constructing method in it. So we can make a nice little factory method and we can just pass in the user and we can default the current time. One of the great things about starting to create these little kind of tiny little value objects is they start to attract other methods. So we had before and now we're making an improvement, right? I can just pass in the inspector and from that inspector, which is a user, I can get all the user attributes that I want. And because I'm mostly capturing uh, events now, I don't actually have to pass it in. I can make that a default parameter. So it's just starting to get easier to work with this code. There's another important um, benefit of making the code go this way is there's actually some errors that previously were possible that are no longer possible. So here, you actually just forget to set the email. And with our new design, we can't actually make that, we can't actually make that mistake anymore. Here's another kind of mistake you can make. Well, you actually put in you know, a different user's email. Like these kind of mistakes could have gotten into the code base and now they can't get into the code base anymore because we've got more abstract kind of code. So there's a lot of benefits to finding names, noticing, du well, noticing duplication, making abstraction, coming up for a name for that. And then typically, as you make these moves, you'll, you'll you'll get to a new point in your code where once again you can notice more, more duplication and more abstraction possibilities. So here's where we got to. Here's what we have in our main class. Now we've written quite a bit of code and you would have to write this code anyways, 
but now we've made it, we've, we're using, uh, you know, the Rails composed of uh, feature to make it clearer as to what we're doing. But if you look at this code, you can see, ah, duplication again. We've got this, con we've got this reviewed, 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 and submitted, submitted, submitted. So once we spot this kind of duplication, we can think, oh, we've got a missing abstraction. So what I would prefer to do is to write something like this. I'd rather just be able to declare my attribution events rather than having to do the whole composed of piece. So there's a class macro, which you can add to your code. And it's really valuable once you start getting stuff more abstract because now you can do things like this. It turned out that a little while later we actually had to add a discarded event. And it became very easy to add it to the code base because we just declare another attribution event. The other thing is that if you were to like search through the code base looking for attribution events, they just kind of pop out now, right? You can find them all over the place. Whereas previously they were just, there was a, it was kind of a hidden concept. So how do you do this in Rails? How do you, how do you, how do you make these new kind of class macros that you can use? You can do it in pure Ruby, but it's, it's, it's really easier to do using a concern. So this is an example of how we can use a concern. Concerns are custom designed for being able to write these kind of class macros. And they're basically mechanisms for hiding complexity. Some people don't like that, some people like that. So your mileage will, <laughs> your mileage will vary. You have to decide whether you think it's worth it. In this particular case, we chose to use the fairly complex mechanism of a concern. So what does a concern look like? Sort of, ah. Um, this is what it would look like. Now, that's the code that we were just writing by hand a moment ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to make, we're, we're, we're writing a class macro, we're writing a function that will write that code for us. And there's how we remove the duplication, right? Because we had, remember before we had reviewed, 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 submitted, submitted, submitted. So now the abstraction, the duplication has gone away because we've got a, a variable here. We've introduced this new method now called attribution event. We pass in a type and then because we're going to include the concern, this, this class macro will be made available to us and when the class first gets read and the class macro will be invoked and it will basically build the little composed of code for us. There's a certain amount of ceremony you have to use to make the concern. You just have to say, oh, I want this to be a class method. But it's, it's a lot of, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a lot of ceremony here, but that's to allow the calling code to be low ceremony. So this is what we had before, and this is what we get now. So we just have to include this new concern that we've made, and now we can declare attribution events. And we don't have all the duplication that we used to have before. So that's using concerns. So what have we done? Ha, we said an attribution event identifies a user, identifies a, a timestamp. We realize that there's different kinds of attribution events. So now this is what our, this is what our code's starting to look like now. We can just include our concern for attribution events and then we can declare attribution events. And then we have a couple of ways of creating attribution events. We have that nice little factory method, that nice little creation method build, which kind of abstracts away the fact that we're taking three components from a user. Now, this kind of, kind of uh, separation of concerns also makes your code much more valuable in the future. Let's suppose that there's another attribute of users that we would like to capture in the future. We're just gonna have to change that in one place in our code. I mean, we're gonna have to create the database columns. But once we've created the database columns, we wanna pull some I don't know, phone number off the user and store that. It's very easy because it's all going to be inside the actual, uh, you, the, none of the calling code will change, right? They just pass a user. And if we want to grab another attribute, it's fine. We just store it. Everything will work fine. So we've come quite a lot away from just having database columns. We've now got this much more stronger, more powerful kind of concept. The next thing that came up was we, we were having debates on the team about what does it mean to um, log, capture, assign, save, or record an attribution event. So we played around with record for a while, but it turns out that we're doing all this work uh, in, in the context of a compliance project. And the thing that we're actually recording is, is called a record. So we realized, ooh, that's not a very good name, right? <laughs> Can't tell whether it's pronounced record or record. So that's not a good name. Log seems, it doesn't really seem like a log. We started using assign because that's our, that's our current technique, right? We have to just assign the value object. So we tried playing around with different sort of things in the code and tried different, plain, trying different verbs. And in the end, we decided that capture was the right, uh, the right name to use. So this is, the kind of thing you, this is the kind of thing I often try when I tell people that I don't really know what the name is. I try to let the code kind of decide. 
So I kind of, kind of try using different names in the code to see uh, which names make sense. So I notice even when I'm giving this presentation, I always talk about capturing attribution events now. But for a while, we weren't really sure how we were doing that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do this instead of doing, instead of doing the assignment, I'd like to be able to write this code. Uh, luckily, we have our concern. And so we can actually just, in, because we've built this concern, we can start to include instance methods as well as class macros. So we can make this nice little method called capture attribution event. <coughs> and you can see the type concept is kind of sneaking in again, right? And so when we, include the when we include the concern, it writes these class macros for us and it writes this little instance method for us. So now I can do this. So before I used to have to assign four separate attributes in order to capture an attribution event, whereas now I can just say, oh, capture the attribution event. It's a submitted one and here's the user. Now under the covers, you know, exactly the same code is uh, executing. It's kind of interesting in some ways that we haven't actually made any change to the database schema at this point. So all the code that depends on that existing schema is just working fine. We just got a more expressive way of sticking those values into the database and also getting them out, right? The nice thing about the, the, um, the composed of macros is that when I read a sheet out of the database, I'm going to get references to these little attribution event objects, right? So that's my example from QCloud. And the two mechanisms that we used were uh, composed of and concerned. So that's the end of the example. So now what I want to do is to kind of revisit the example and talk about some of the uh, resources that you can go to, to find out more about how to do this kind of stuff. And I want to talk about one particular uh, diagram that really made a big difference for me. And it talks about what the interaction between naming and designing. So these are the words that we eventually like, came to, right? And I, I don't know for me, I don't know for you, but for me, I would, have, I would have had a hard time kind of deriving these words from just the four database columns. It wouldn't have been clear to me that this was really what the code was doing. But now the code actually says pretty much the English, right? So when I talk to the product people about capturing attribution events and what are the fields in an attribution event, we're all talking the same language now. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we started and that's where we ended up. And I don't know, I, 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 I hope you got some kind of sense of this kind of thing where the naming actually contributes very much to our design. And once we start designing and we make abstractions, we have to give them names. So designing is very connected to uh, naming. So these are the two books that I would say you want to start with. Um, Eric Evans wrote this great book called Domain Driven Design, where he introduced this practice called ubiquitous language. And Kent Beck wrote this book, Extreme Programming, where he introduced a practice called simple design. So we're going to talk about those briefly. Um, Eric Evans believes that this was his, you know, a significant contribution to the world of software, and I think he's right. He kind of synthesized a lot of object-oriented design principles, but he actually coined this phrase of a ubiquitous language. And ubiquitous language means that everybody on the team uses the same language for everything. So you would expect to, so for example, in, in the QCloud application, there's a setting which says enable attribution workflows. And so that turns on the attribution workflows. So that the terminology just sort of gets everywhere. One of the things that's tricky about this is that after six months on a project, if you decide that you'd now like to refer to a concept with a different name, if you practice domain-driven design, you're obligated to go into your code base and change all the names to the new name. It's tremendously powerful if you can do it, though. Uh, on the project that I currently work on, which is another project at my company, uh, we have a con it's a supply chain application, and people are making products which are finished goods, and they're using subcomponents, and the users think of these things as items, but in the code it's called SKU. And we never got around to renaming it, but every time we have conversations with the product people, we go, we're gonna make a new item in the item master, and we go, oh, you mean a SKU? And they go, no, an item. And anyway, it just, it just causes a lot of friction and a lot of translations. So ideally, you wanna try to minimize the frictions when you're talking to your product people. And it's kind of amazing when you have, if you get all your ubiquitous design and you get it all lined up correctly, then when you're talking about the code, you're actually talking about the product and vice versa. So you can see that on QCloud, we tried to do these things and we have sheets and we have inspections and we have forms. And so there's actually models called form, sheet, and inspection. 
Anyway, it's a great book. Uh, there's been a couple of books that have been published since then. I think there's a, there's a freely downloadable copy on InfoQ, which is kind of just a summary of this book. This book, I can, think, came out in 2004. It's a great book. So Simple Design, XP, came out in 1999, second edition. Simple Design is these four, these four practices. So the idea is that your, your design would be simple to the degree to which it passes its tests, reveals intention, no duplication, and fewest elements. So I would say you can pretty much just use these two concepts and you'll get, you know, you get 95% of simple design. Now, I'm assuming you're also doing TDD. So you're, if you're doing TDD, you're already writing all your tests and all your tests are passing anyway. So you don't need to include that as part of simple design. But really what you're really trying to do is you're trying to remove duplication, in other words, to reveal intention. Primarily by removing duplication, again, that gets you most of the benefits of, of, of making your code more understandable. And also you want to improve names. Now, at one point, people are always wondering, like, what's the priority? Is it more important to improve names or is it more important to remove duplication? And different people would argue about it. And, you know. turned, out, turned out that uh, uh, someone called J.B. Rainsberger, also known as J.Brains, I guess, because that's his, uh, his handle, he, he wrote this really great diagram. And really what I hope is that you will be able to use this diagram to improve your code. He basically says, look, it doesn't matter which one. You can start with either one. So let's start, let's start on the left with the green start here. So we're going to remove some, well, let's, yeah, let's, I guess that's where we started. We removed duplication. We, know, we noticed that there was some duplication in the names of the columns. So you can see some structure. Structure needs names, and we made, you know, we made attribution event. We came up with that name. And oftentimes when you're improving names, new abstractions emerge. And so you have to get, you get a higher order kind of duplication. Do you remember when we first created the, um, the attribution event, we were passing in three separate user fields. And then we realized, oh, that's kind, of dupl that's kind of a form of duplication, right? Why don't we just pass in the user? So we made the little build method. So he calls this the simple design dynamo. I, don't, I, I think he's just joking about the trademark, but anyway, he calls it that. <laughs> so, but I mean, I don't know. It, it's really like... Um, had a really big influence on how I program because it means I don't have to get the names right initially. I don't really have to get the design right initially. I can just make all these like small moves. So like the, in the example from QCloud I showed you, not, like I had, none of us had any idea that that's where we were going to wind up. We just started making small moves. So just a little bit of duplication, make some abstractions, more duplication, make some names. Like it wasn't a matter of like thinking really hard to come up with where we got to. It's a matter of just going around the cycle a bunch of times. So the other thing, too, is you, you, you can stop whenever you want to, and then you can come back and pick it up later, right? Just make these nice incremental improvements. So extreme programming uh, explained has this concept of simple design. It's one of the core practices sort of in the inner loop of what developers do every day. They do test-driven development. They do refactoring. They do simple design, and they do pairing if you're doing XP. So it's really fundamental uh, design practice. JB has some nice, uh, nice um, articles about this as well. I don't have um, references in my slides, but when I publish them, I'll make sure there's references. So this is where we started. We just noticed that there was some duplication, missing concept. We, made, we took advantage of this little composed of uh, macro to basically call out the fact that we had these little objects, which we named attribution event. So that's kind of like one cycle around the dynamic design dynamo. We made this nice little value object, getting some improvements. Hmm. Notice some duplication with the inspector name. Made this little build method, more abstraction. Huh. Lots more duplication here. Missing concept. Introduced this nice, uh, well, I don't know if it's nice. Anyway. <laughs> Introduced this concern to sort of <laughs> put that complexity out of the way. Um, So we started here, and we got to here. So now we can just declare attribution events, and we can capture attribution events of different types. When I, de when I, when I declare the attribution event reviewed, I'm really declaring a kind of little reviewed type, which I can then use when I go to capture it. Just go around this circle a bunch of times. So I guess my, uh, my, uh, I guess my hope is that you don't settle for poor names 
because if you do, you're missing chances to add more abstraction. So I guess, I don't know, pretty please, <laughs> don't, something like that. <laughs> it makes a big difference on your project if you, really, if you really obsess about names. I think what was really liberating for me about the dynamic design dynamo is I don't have to obsess, so, you know, I don't have to obsess and worry about getting them wrong. Improve them. The code will change its shape. I can now look at the code and the code will help me like kind of get, you know, get me some more insight. Build an abstraction, need a name, go around and around and around. Naming is very important, right? Like this is, this is a really fun tweet. <coughs> anyway, so naming things is super important. And I think that I really got to, f I, I know for myself that I understood the value once I realized, oh, it's not really just naming, it's naming plus design. And that naming really is very, very deeply connected with design. And so when I'm improving my names, I'm really thinking more about just improving the design. It's not just substituting one name for another name. Anyway, thanks. <laughs>